Hello and welcome to Art of Ancient Egypt. We will be studying these five different periods, starting with the early dynastic Egypt around 2950 BCE, and we'll be ending with the New Kingdom around 1075 BCE. We're going to be talking about the Great Pyramids, how they were built, and a whole bunch of other interesting concepts that relate to this time period. If you want to listen to some music that I found that might have been uh, something that they were listening to throughout these different um, periods of this history. So we came from um, our last chapter, weekly readings and things like that were around Mesopotamia. And I'm kind of showing you a map here that shows the different empires. So we have an empire up in a northern part of kind of Europe, uh, the Middle East. Um, the Hitti Empire was mentioned in Bibles and it was kind of um, a forgotten empire that does is in your history books but isn't as um, relevant and doesn't get as much information discussed about it. So if you're interested in learning more about it, I kind of included a link here. But just to show you that there were a couple of different empires happening kind of all at the same time. So we have the Mesopotamian empires, which we were talking about. We have the um, Egyptian empires, which we're going to be talking about today. And they're all sort of um, coexisting and there's trade happening and there's also warfare happening but I want you to get a sense of the geography of this time period and so who had what type of land how much land where the land was located and things like that so a little bit about um, the Mediterranean and this area of Egypt you can also see a lot of the um, monuments that we'll be talking about throughout this lecture and you can definitely recognize how much the Nile River was such an important part of the civilization being built near it because the river was sustaining these people. And then you can also see how we're distinguishing the upper and lower uh, according to the direction of the flow. So the lower uh, according to the flow of the river and the upper, which are things that we'll be talking about in this lecture. The history of the Nile um, is incredibly important in far as like the, the history of how we developed as a people. Um, you have, it's one of the longest rivers in the world, about 4,258 miles. Um, North America from the East Coast to the West Coast is about 5,057 miles, so you can kind of get a sense of its size, knowing how big um, our country is, or North America. Um, by around 8,000 BCE, the, you know, people were mostly living off of the fish and game and the plants, and again, this is more prehistoric people that were living in this part of the Middle East. Around 5000 BC, they started adapting agriculture, which is similar to the, the um, cultures that we studied during the Neolithic time. And then, you know, they started having social and political transformations and creating communities and having more of a um, sense of, of, of a group and responsibility. Um, there were several chieftains um, in, off of the Nile Valley uh, area and chieftains would have been again this acknowledgement of the houses and families selected people who would have either been some sort of educated to a certain level they might have been um, medicine men and priests and then their families kind of was the lineage which then would eventually unfold into the pharaohs and the kings. And here's just some examples of some of the art that you might find from the prehistoric period in Egypt. So I thought I would just include some of these images that are not really um, shown in your reading. So the early diagnostic 
uh, Egypt was, like I said, the dates about 2950 to 2575 BCE. And this was really when the upper and lower uh, concept of this division was um, in rule. And they did have political rulers. And of course, there was the importance of worshiping and really starting to create beliefs around honoring the gods. And they had many gods. Um, and here's a couple of examples of some of the artifacts that have been found. You can see um, the portraits of a family. So this would have been commissioned by an artist. These would have been um, something found in their, their burial tombs. A comb, you can just barely see the tooths of a comb. And then a tablet, which would have been sort of some sort of uh, funerary, um, almost like a gravestone. Here's just some of the Egyptian symbols that have been incredibly um, important when you're looking at the different markings and um, when you start to look at some of the things that were found in the tombs, you're going to see certain symbols over and over again because it was kind of a form of their written language. And so being able to identify um, one of the most well-known, which is kind of at the beginning of what looks like similar to a, the, a, a cross. Um, so the angst is a very well-known and it's part of the system of writing that I was just talking about. The Eye of Horus, which is also um, connected to the, the falcon, which was a very important symbol. Um, the was, which was like a staff that would have been used in ceremonial. Well, we see it a lot in paintings and reliefs. And so it was, it was definitely connected to power and being a ruler, a pharaoh, and then also kings later on. The scarab beetle, which was definitely a symbol of um, creation and resurrection and immortality, the rising sun. Um, and so it was definitely part of a sense of transformation and protection, and it was used often in funerary art as well. And there are many other symbols that you could research. These are just four of some of the main ones that you'll see. A lot of the um, pharaohs and rulers, the Egyptian, the people who then symbolize their sort of connection to the gods and goddesses um, during this time period, they were oftentimes depicted as human beings with an animal head. And so here I found kind of um, all these different gods and goddesses that um, could have been both um, a, a non-real person and uh, converted into a pharaoh or a priest or a, a high, higher person in the noble ranks um, who would then have oops, sorry about that, who would have these uh, heads as an animal. So here we have the depiction of the human form in the artistic traditions that we'll be talking about from the Egyptian time period. But you have, it's the head of a lion, which communicates the goddess of war for Shechemet. So, and again, the lion would have been considered a ferocious creature and being uh, someone who would symbolize this power and might. So speaking of the artistic conventions, um, it was a really important way that the Egyptians re represented humans and their actions and expressions. And so it's kind of like um, iconography, obviously, but also just a style that for 3,000 years, all of these figures were drawn this way. So oftentimes when you think of Egyptian art, you think of this very stylized fashion that was predominantly um, thought of and created. So it's almost like there had to have been a school to teach people how to draw in this composite pose where the heads were in profile, but the shoulders and the torsos were shown frontally, the hips and the legs were also often shown in profile, and kind of like the illusion of walking. And so they think that maybe that might have represented power, because most of the time this artistic convention was predominantly used for the rulers and the people of a higher royalty, but when they represented uh, the lesser classes, oftentimes the servants who would 
you know, they would have statues of the servants in the tombs, which I'll be talking about. They were engaged in more normal physical gestures. So it's a distinguished and also like a, a way of recognizing these different classes. Here we have an image of the Book of the Dead from uh, 1285 BCE. And so I'll be talking about that a little bit later as well. And this is just a visual example of what the um, artist conventions would have looked like. So there would have been some sort of mathematical drawings to indicate how to create this stylized form of visual representation of these folks that were of a higher ranking in the class system. And um, the Egyptians used the fist, the fist of a hand, as a way of measuring the height so these, the, everything could be very accurate in the reliefs that were created. And this is a stele that shows this process. Colors and symbolisms, there was a lot of colors used and most of the imagery, especially when it came to honoring the pharaohs and the goddess and goddesses and the, like I said, the people of the higher classes, you're going to see very specific symbolism. And so, um, the and this was kind of also part of the artistic convention so black equaling night death resurrection fertility you pretty much only see these six colors so they probably had figured out a palette um, making the paint from flowers and roots and all different types of natural processes um, so black white red yellow green and blue and each color symbolized a very specific uh, feeling and or contributed to the mythology and the legends that were being communicated in the paintings, the sculptures, and the wall reliefs. So something to make note of, and you might want to include this in your discussion posts. Narmer palette, palette is an example of the artistic conventions of the time with these um, sort of side the profile with the torso being more frontal and then the other parts of the body being in more of a profile. This particular palette um, would have been a visual representation of the unification of Upper and Lower Egypt. And so what's interesting is it also illustrates the hierarchical scale which is an abstract representation of size. And so Narmer, the ruler, the largest uh, figure in this, uh, uh, the relief sculpture, is um, clearly the one in power. And the sculpture, there's some symbolization with the, this would have been a white crown. All of these things would have been painted that we're looking at, but the painting has faded away over the thousands of years that it was covered under stand, sand. So here we have um, the white crown and then on the back of the relief, you have the crown that represented um, lower Egypt. So the white crown representing upper Egypt, the red cobra crown uh, symbolizing lower Egypt and the fact that it was on this one uh, palette also coincides with this concept of unification. So moving on, funerary architecture. So during the early dynastic um, period, they started creating, um, well, there was the fascination with the spirit world and the afterlife. And so due to that, they created a whole system to honor the dead. And so the mastabas, which would have been kind of the precursor to the pyramids, um, were constructed to hold the spirit of the body, of the, of the human body, because they needed the body to be able to go into their afterlife. And so some people were buried with statues and, um, I mean, not some, any of the higher nobles who could afford this type of um, house for your soul, your afterlife, your spirit, you would have a statue that would be a substitute for your body. And then they also did mummification later on. You would have furnishings inside of your tomb. There would have been um, some sort of um, outside sealed room that your family could come to 
There would be burial chambers with a lot of the valuable things um, underneath. And um, when they were, they were oftentimes almost like a cemetery. So this would be a precursor to what we now might visit a relative as a cemetery. And this would have been the city of the dead because they would have been grouped together. So we're starting to see more uh, a different way in Egypt than we saw in the previous lectures of how they're honoring the dead and creating these um, kind of burial chambers. The Mastabas sort of um, evolved to become the pyramids. And so the original structure, like I was explaining before, um, would have had, you know, a flat roof. And then they started to create these step pyramids, which was kind of like bef before the pyramid. So it was partially probably them architecturally figuring these things out, mathematically figuring out how to um, secure the weight of these stones that would create these pyramids. And so we went from the Mastabas to the step pyramids. Um, and then finally, um, we evolved to get to the pyramids. And one of the reasons why this evolution happened was because the pharaohs wanted something more grandiose than uh, this, this kind of, I guess at a certain point in history, it just seemed too simple and not, um, didn't really visually um, represent the intellect and power and might and strength that these structures would would indicate if a traveler was coming through, the pharaohs wanted to impress them with these, um, sorry again, my cursor is just going crazy, um, with these uh, architectural feats. And so what's interesting to think about is how decorated uh, these tombs would have been both inside and then how they were made. And another reason why they made the tombs was because it made it more difficult for the grave robbers and the people who might be coming from a different territory with different belief systems, they wouldn't be able to get into the tombs and they were the way they were constructed. So there's a lot of different reasons why they evolved from the lower a burial chamber type environment into the pyramids that were are, that they're famous for today, and eventually we'll also talk a little bit about um, how they were also built into cliffs to uh, for a whole bunch of different reasons. So one of the first architects that I think is important to mention is um, Imhotep. Um, and he was a high fish official, sort of a sage architect, astrologer, and he was the chief minister to De Djoser, who reigned as the um, king. They weren't quite pharaohs yet. They, they, it's interesting as you, I'm just going to glaze over all this stuff, but they went from kings to pharaohs to kings and then back to pharaohs. They, they've been all over the place. Um, but what's important about this particular individual at this time is that he was one of the few Egyptian scholars who was considered a god but was actually a real person and it was just because he was so skilled and smart and able to uh, figure out how to, I mean he's kind of the person who figured out how to stack these incredibly heavy stones to make the pyramids. And so because of his intellect, he became kind of greater than life in a similar way that um, some of our athletes today almost kind of rise to these really incredible high positions because of their, not because of their, um, their brains, but because of their skills as an athlete. And they're, some of them are very smart. So let's move on to the Old Kingdom. I found this really interesting image because you have to think about there must have been construction going on all of the time. We'll talk a little bit about um, the pyramids in a minute and how intense the building process would have been. And so this is just a digital illustration. I think it's from some sort of a digital game, but I really liked how it showed this idea of this constant construction happening during this time period. And so during the Old Kingdom, um, 
there was a lot of political and social stability, which allowed them to then grow these massive cities and, and artifacts and sculptures and tombs and everything that they were creating. And so this is considered the age of the pyramids. Uh, the capital of Egypt at this time was Memphis, and it was populated at an estimated around 40,000 people. Um, there was a lot of wealth in this time. There were merchants and uh, scholars and teachers and all the folks that would have to support um, the system that was happening with all of this uh, growth. And so there would be farmers and you know doctors. So it was a really working civilization. Um, one of the pharaohs from the old kingdom uh, ruled for around 90 years and you know so there was a just that's that also equals a tremendous amount of faith and um, trust in that type of leadership during this time um, there was a lot of uh, the creation of this uh, art convention which was used for 3,000 years uh, they started establishing trade with many of the foreign civilizations that were also flourishing around them. Uh, they had ships to travel this, the Red Sea and the Mediterranean to also explore and um, trade with other cultures. Um, the cities were very lively and um, happening uh, all, you know, with all the different things that were going on. So um, the pyramids of Giza were built um, by a succession of kings that were all part of one big family, so to speak. Um, and so just thinking about how they were built, when they were built, um, the different sizes of the structures, the fact that they were um, fathers and sons, um, and just the the feet of these monuments is really impressive because they have been, they've survived for thousands of years. So it would be nice if you took a minute to watch some of this information about the building and the construction and the importance of the pyramids, which of course represented, they're visually representing, pointing towards the gods, the sun. And they think that possibly the top of the largest pyramid which they think is around uh, 481 feet. It was might have been topped and painted in gold, and then the rest of it would have been white. So again, they would have stood out if you were traveling um, to do trade from, let's say, a thousand miles away or by boat or however you would have seen these beautiful pyramids from far away. So that also communicated the power of the particular ruler at the time. Here's just another image um, and also I kind of listed out so the size of the pyramids um, so Minikirf uh, the son of Kirif um, the and so there was like the different sons of different rulers um, would have been handed down from generation to generation so the the ruling of this territory would have been pretty much by like one family. And of course, you kind of see that in our contemporary politics as well, but I'm not gonna get into that. In the past, a lot of times, that's how things would be. So the cemetery, which I was talking about before, City of the Dead, um, here we're seeing it's west of the Great Pyramids. And you can really kind of see how this does sort of start to visually emulate or copy um, a contemporary cemetery. And so you have all these mestables which would have been above ground with their um, burial chambers underneath. And it also reminds me of the beginning of city blocks. There's all these interesting sort of ancient um, visual ideas that you then that can translate into contemporary uh, cities. So the building of these the pyramids, um, they think that there might have been about 5,000 workers who would have built the pyramids, and it took about 20 to the 30 years. And um, each stone weighed about two and a half tons, and they were transported. I found an image that kind of shows how they might have been transported by these men. Um, they're moving these massive 
uh, stones across the desert with some sort of wetting of the sand and then pulling it. And if you're interested, I've, I've got lots of different videos for you to watch. This one is required to watch. These are just really interesting. It's a whole series about the building of the pyramids. But it's pretty interesting to think about how massive these stones they were. Uh, we're not sure about how far away the curry was where they were making them. So how far did they have to carry these stones? And then thinking that they're taking these stones up, the largest pyramid being about 480 feet high. So again, and then the mathematical calculations that would have had to have um, navigated to build these uh, historical monuments. So moving on to the sculpture from the Old Kingdom, um, you're, you, there would have been a lot of life-size three-dimensional sculptures um, and fine uh, reliefs in stone, copper, and wood. Um, the art that was made followed the traditions that I spoke about before that had been taught and handed down, so there must have been some sort of schooling system where people would learn these traditions. Um, they had really perfected um, carving and uh, visually um, making landscapes and communicating the the details and uh, you're seeing it here in this image how clear the visual representation of the hawk and then the um, Carfi's uh, uh, face and body f structure uh, and again the fist representing power and might um, and so it's really interesting to think about how the tools that would have been made and to be able to have this sort of perfectly sculpted uh, bodies to, again, represent the power and the strength of these rulers and they're young and healthy and all of these things, again, start to show that visual representation of the perfect person who would supposedly be ascended or descended or connected to the gods. Also part of the Old Kingdom sculpture, sculpture, like I was saying before, the pharaohs and the rulers were sculpted in a very particular way to visually show their power and strength and kind of perfection, almost the way that sometimes we see um, actors and actresses in our world today. But the working folks you would have been sculpted in a much more realistic manner. So there's a little bit of realism creeping in when we're looking at this um, limestone sculpture of a butcher, and these would have been found in the tombs of high-ranking officials and or um, pharaohs and kings. And here we have a wood that would have been gessoed and painted um, of a woman grinding grain. So again, like you would have in the tombs these perfectly sculptured, painted reliefs of the pharaoh and the nobles and however whatever the upper class would have been perfectly posed to show honor and then the people serving them would have been much more lifelike. Another thing I want you to just take a note of is where these different ancient art objects are found. So these would be the physical properties that we talked about a while ago. We've got the butcher, where, where it was found, what tomb, uh, when it's from, what it's made out of, and then finally where it lives. So obviously the, the Oriental um, Institute Museum, University of Chicago, is not where this was found. So one of the discussions later on will be to think about uh, where the artwork was created thousands of years ago and where it lives today. So art of the ancient... So now we're moving on to the Middle Kingdom and the New Kingdom. And you can see here um, the, how these old, the, how they're evolving and growing. So the size of the old kingdom is in yellow and it's smaller. The middle kingdom is a little bit bitter, bigger, and then the new kingdom is even larger. And that's due to a bunch of different reasons. Um, the, each kingdom taking more territory, either through force or through um, having the people agree because then they might get food and grain and support. So there's all different reasons why these kingdoms are growing, but they're definitely growing. 
So during the Middle Kingdom, also the period of reunification, um, the Old Kingdom collapsed and these powerful kings, um, you know, they had gained so much power, there was a lot of political turmoil. Um, so for about 150 years, it was a little bit chaotic. And then during the Middle Kingdom, they started to reunite the country and uh, bring the, the power back to the royal families because it had sort of fallen apart. And um, you start to see this in the artwork and and during the Middle Kingdom, the sculptures, I really like this one. It's not in your book, but I just think it's beautifully created. Um, and I would encourage you to watch this video that talks about how it was made and the significance of this particular object in relationship to where it was found and why certain um, rulers would have these very specific um, sculptures of important people in their lives now in buried in their tombs. The portraits from this particular area um, even of the king and the pharaohs start to show more of a, a naturalistic and realistic expression. Uh, the pharaohs at this time had kind of been, um, well, they were responding to the fact that there had been all this chaos, right? And so um, the, the officials of the smaller provinces had taken a lot of the resources away from the pharaohs. And so during this time, the pharaohs were working very hard to reinsert themselves with this power. And they did it in manipulative ways. Sometimes they would uh, keep food from particular provinces, forcing that province to um, have a relationship with the pharaoh to then be able to get their food back. And so it was manipulative, but it was also required in a way in for the well, the pharaoh or the kings would think that um, because they wanted to regain their power. And so you're kind of seeing how the um, this extra effort that, that wasn't like a, a good time is showing in the sculptures. Here's some examples of the tomb relief. And so a lot of working class people who couldn't afford um, the mastabas or the uh, cut rock tombs might commission someone to make a funerary stele that would be like a little um, acknowledgement of the family and the life of the person who was in the tomb. And again, you're, I'm sure you probably saw at the time different types of steles were being made, but if they used the artist conventions, then that symbolized that higher class. And another example, um, this is a famous one that was included in your reading where they're talking about um, really showing the relationship and the importance of family and food. So this might have been a merchant who um, had a portrait of his family and it's showing again the wealth um, with the food and then the love that they're sharing as a family. So moving on to the New Kingdom, uh, about 1539 to uh, 1075 BCE. And so for about 500 years during the New Kingdom, um, this was sort of considered the era of the warrior pharaoh because now the pharaohs had kind of regained their um, place in the hierarchy of the civilization. And um, there was um, more, they were flourishing politically and economically. And you really start to see that with um, the expansive um, complexes and temples that were being created at the time. And here's just a digital reconstruction of the Great Karnak Temple, um, which would have been, you know, had all of the different various temples because they had gone um, and reconnected and there was a lot of investment put into the temples to honor the gods. And here's like a modern day photo. So you're, you know, seeing tourist buses, but it's held up pretty well considering how old it is. And it, it shows the extensive building prop programs that were going on at the time. And it shows some of the religious centers of the new kingdom. And you're starting to see again, um, 
sort of reestablishing the connections between the people, their beliefs, and the rulers. And here's another, um, you can watch the whole thing or just the first two minutes where it talks specifically about this um, really important complex. And you can see the different gates that people would have to go through, which helped with security. Um, they oftentimes would take, so this is was expanding the great temple of Anam. Um, so one of the previous rulers and they would expand the complex and just make it bigger and larger and um, more um, to represent the power of the current uh, king. So they would just grow these massive uh, complexes. Moving on, um, I hope you guys are doing okay. I'm trying to speed through this. Um, the New Kingdom, during this time there was the first female pharaoh and um, she had a big impact on the visual language of how pharaohs were represented and this is a really great video that you should watch and learn a little bit more about her role in this history. Um, and how she came to power, and how even though she was a woman, she wanted to visually display herself as a man, because she didn't want people outside of her territory to know she was a woman. But she really did make some different changes, because she had a different perspective, and and um, did, did some pretty interesting political things that were very important during her time. But I think it's fascinating that she had to rep represent herself as a man. And here's her um, rock cut tomb, which was something that they started to move towards and away from the um, the pyramid tombs because the pyramids sort of symbolized, hey, you know, come steal all the stuff inside this special space if you can get in. And of course, they did all sorts of things to try and make it harder for thieves to get into the tombs and find the valuables, but still. They were oftentimes, um, things were, a lot of things were stolen over time. So, or even in the time period of the people who were honoring um, the different pharaohs. I really like uh, the structure of her particular rock cut tomb. And when you learn more about her, she really did want to try to have a different relationship with the massive terrain that she um, ruled over. Moving on to um, the art of the Amarna period, which um, would have been from about 1353 to 1336 BCE, and this would have been Queen Nefertiti and King Atanatum. And they had some really interesting ideas. Um, and again, I encourage you to watch this three minute video. I know that you, you may or may not, but it might be helpful. What they were really wanting to do fix my misspelled word, um, is have a different way of creating their artwork. And so they moved away from the traditions that had been happening for thousands of years. And they wanted to portray um, a different stylized way of looking at the royal rulers. And so you can kind of see that here um, where you're not seeing it in profile and you're seeing a little bit more of a realistic uh, definition of the body. And again, um, it's interesting when they were in power, um, they had a different belief system. They were trying to work away, move away from honoring so many gods and focusing just on the sun god. And then Atnaton wanted to um, convince the masses that he actually was the sun god and a lot of people were like i don't know about that and so you can kind of see that in some of the imagery and the um the stylized script as well that would have indicated the the propaganda around these ideas and then finally atnaton um you know of course died and his son king tut came into power um and because King Tut was so young, he came into power when he was only about nine years old um, and he was in power for about 10 years. He was easily um, advised to go back to the old traditions, uh, the visual traditions, the belief systems in 
um, multiple gods. And so, um, it kind of, it kind of, uh, made certain people very happy to go back to the old ways. And then there are probably some people who were interested in trying to do things differently in a new light. Here you see, um, one of the many treasures that were uncovered um, in 1922 when they discovered his tomb, which hadn't been um, totally pillaged and stolen. And it's amazing to think that this mask was made from like 240 pounds of gold. Um, so it's interesting to think about King Tut's life. He didn't really do that much in his life, except for make a really cool tomb with lots of amazing stuff inside. Um, and it's speculated how he died because he died so young and um, the way that he died. But that's one of the reasons why he was also didn't make as much of an impact because he died at such a young age. And then finally moving on to the Ramses who were also honoring um, the, the old traditional ways, but they were building these massive um, complexes and uh, tombs and things, and a lot of the rock cut tombs um, to show again their power and might. And then finally, um, just to mention their, the Book of the Dead, because it's also important and discussed in your reading, but to me what it really symbolizes is kind of like um, a, a text of spells or kind of like a cookbook or however you want to relate to that that would illustrate how you get into the afterlife. So what you need to do, what you need to say to the different gods, how you need to be as a person in your life that will then help you get into this really amazing afterlife. And here's a video that talks more about those specifics. And then finally, finally, here's some helpful links that um, you can click around and check out and learn more about any specifics. I went through this as quickly as possible. Thank you so much for your time. I hope you enjoyed the lecture.